Good afternoon, everybody. <clears throat> Welcome back to another adventure, another episode of Mythgard in Middle-Earth. Uh, I'm Corey Olson, the Tolkien Professor, joined, as always, though belatedly, uh, by my friend Grifflet, who is invisible. Where? At... Oh, he's... He's hiding. Oh, there he is. Okay, right. Uh, naturally, because, of course, here he is lost in there. Well, not lost, but out in the wilds of Isengard. And, uh, uh, you know, it's a dangerous place. So he was hiding in the bushes. That's very cunning of you there, Grifflet. Sorry, I'm just looking at the uh, that Orthonk from below. That is so cool. Hey, would you? Yeah, thank you. Get inside Grifflet's head. There we go. Okay. That looks so good. I really like Isengard. Um, it was funny, I was reflecting... When was this? And as always, like, I can't keep my teaching things separate. I think it was... Yes, it was. It was in Mythgard Academy this past week. We were looking at... Um, we're talking about Minas Morgul. Uh, and uh, uh, looking, since we were looking at the first drafts of the of the Kirithungal sequence, which is amazing, right? Um, like trivia question, you know, right? What the name of the spider? So originally there were going to be a whole bunch of giant spiders in the past that they were going to go through, uh, to whom Gollum was going to betray Frodo and Sam, right? And then once they actually get into the past, and he starts describing it. Tolkien like realizes that uh, uh, that there's only one giant spider, right? So the giant spider comes out who attacks Frodo. Do you know who the giant spider was, right? Shelob. He decides eventually to call her, right? But you 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 know, Ungoliant, Ungoliant. The first draft, the first couple drafts of the Kirith Ungol chapter have Ungoliant is the spider who waylays Frodo and gets stabbed by Sam. Not a spider named Ungoliant. I'm very convinced of this um, because he had just retold the story. He had just said originally that the spiders, like in the Shilo, like the Shilob thing, right? Like the, the spiders, when there were plural spiders, the spiders that infested the past, they were going to be the brood of Ungoliant, far worse than the spiders of Mirkwood. And he recalled, these are the spiders that uh, Baron fought, um, you know, in Arid Gorgoroth up above Doriath on his way down. And then, so he's not recycling. He's not just recycling a name and, you know, a, a, a spider with, a, you know, the, the spider concept with the name of Ungoliant, right? No, no, no. No, he actually then decides, no, 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 no. This isn't going to be just the brood of Ungoliant, right? This isn't, aren't going to be just, this is going to be Ungoliant herself. Kind of amazing, right? Kind of, uh, uh, Mind blowing. I, I anyway, I thought it was pretty cool. Anyway, so in the context of talking about that, I was talking about the desolation of evil that tends to surround, um, you know, the way that the land kind of gets tainted by powerful evil creatures in Tolkien's world. We see this. We first see it, of course, uh, in the desolation of Smaug. It's like chronologically, we first see it in the desolation of Smaug in the Hobbit. Right. We see it much more forcibly around Mordor when Sam and Frodo get there. Um, but of course we even get, no, it wasn't there. I was talking about it there too. No, it was in the context of my Lord of the Rings, uh, my exploring the Lord of the Rings field trip when we were in Angmar, looking at the game in Angmar. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. That too. Anyhow. Um, so I, um, I uh, was reflecting on Isengard when I was up there. And so I'm, I'm thinking about it now when I'm coming around here, how, it's almost like Saruman knows the motif, right? Isengard is not polluted because of his evil, right? He cuts down the trees. The trees don't wither and die in Isengard because of the power and evil influence of Saruman. He's got to, like, manufacture it, right? It's a manufactured desolation that Saruman has built around himself, that Grifflet is currently surrounded by here. Um, it's almost like Saruman is fronting, right? You know, he, he, he knows that he's, he, he, he's a wannabe evil villain, 
right? And he knows what happens. Like, you can always tell the big evil villains because they're surrounded by this desolate, desolate wilderness, right? So what does he do when he sets himself, when he, like, hangs out his shingle, right, as an evil supervillain or wannabe supervillain? He's like, well, I better create a desolation around myself because all of the coolest super evil supervillains have, are surrounded by a desolation. Uh, So he... uh, uh, so he so he he makes one right, and that I think is hilarious. So Marielle asks, why does he have to make the desolation artificially? Marielle, I think he's in a rush, right? You know, maybe look, I think he's legitimately he's evil enough, right? But I think that he a he doesn't have enough connection to the land around him, right? That's one thing. Um, you know, and this is even just picking up Marielle on the conversation we were just having in the Silm Film Project, talking about like elvish rulers and the relationship that they have with the land. You know, when when like an elf lord establishes their realm, it's not just about establishing, you know, political sovereignty over the other you know people in that realm. It's about their relationship with the land itself. Um, like Galadriel and Lothlorien, that's when you why when you cross the boundaries of Lothlorien, you find yourself in a you know, it, it, it feels like you're entering a different world, right? Um, you're entering this elvish realm. Anyway, um, so the, the evil kingdoms are kind of like that, right? Um, it's the realm when you're, you're entering the realm of Sauron and he has established his dominion over that land. And it's, again, not just about dominion over the people. It's about a relationship with the land, too. And so the land itself comes to reflect his own corruption, Right, his own, uh, uh, his his own, like that 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 sort of that de- that death, that desolation, that withering of all that is green and positive and fruitful and good. Um, so, uh, anyway, yeah. So, Mario, I think it's two things. I think it's first of all, it's a reflection of the fact that now he's been there in Isengard for some time, right? Um, so, because there, are th- I can think of three reasons why a spontaneous desolation of evil would not have grown around Saruman. One, he's not been there long enough, right? So he's not established that kind of longevity of connection with the land. Two, he's not powerful enough, right? Like it's, the land doesn't respond to him. He's, he, he, he doesn't have enough sort of power. Or three, he's insufficiently evil, right? <laughs> so that the, 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 his presence and his connection to the land doesn't lead to like the withering and corruption. Those are the three reasons I could think of why Isengard would not, in fact, have become a spontaneous desolation so that he has to create it himself. Right. Uh, So. um, uh, So. Which of those three, you know, which one or multiple of those three reasons applies in Saruman's case? I'm tempted to say the time thing, but he's been in Isengard for a while. It's been at least hundreds of years. It's been since the time right after Helm Hammerhand that he was, that he's been living there. So it's been several centuries, right? That's not a huge amount of time, but remember Smaug wasn't in, in, in Erebor for a huge amount of time either. So I think based upon the precedent, certainly establishing Smaug as a precedent, we would have to say he has been a sufficient quantity of time to establish that. So is he not evil enough or is he not powerful enough? Um, and I think, is he evil enough? Yeah, yeah. No, I think he's evil enough. Now, it's possible, of course, is his evilness of too recent amount. Like, it, did he go over the edge, right, into evil too recently? You know, no, again, I don't think it's a time thing. I don't think he's insufficiently evil. I think he's just a, no- a nobody, basically. Not quite a nobody. That's not quite fair. But he's not a supervillain. He's just a villain, right? Um... I think that he, uh, so, so th- th- I think that that's why uh, Isengard hasn't become a desolation. So, in chopping everything down and encouraging these very impressive thorn bushes to grow up instead, uh, he is, again, he's fronting, right? He is trying to make out that he is a major supervillain, and he's, he's not a supervillain. Uh, exactly. Uh, Mariel, that's just what I was thinking. The breeding of the Urukai is evil enough. 
Uh, that is exactly what I was thinking of, too. That shows, has he really gone over the edge, or is he just kind of a wannabe evil? No, he's not just wannabe evil. Legitimately evil, but I, I think he's not I think he's not powerful enough. He absolutely is a minor leaguer, Druid's Fire. That's just it. Um, uh, he's a villain, genuine villain, been, but he's a he's he's just he's a bush league villain, and he he doesn't want to admit it. Um, he does have uh, sovereignty, right? He does have a. I mean, his army is a legitimate army. Like the army that comes to Helm's Deep um, is a, is a legitimate force. It can't really compare to Sauron's forces, right? But you know, really, he should have conquered Rohan um, and would have done had it not been for you know those pesky kids and their dog. I mean, the ants. But, um, he, uh, so, I mean, he was, he's a legitimate threat. And as I've said before, I really like how Lotro shows him, um, you know, his influence, his political influence, right? Uh, sort of spreading up through Eriador, how he's trying to sort of solidify his control over all of Eriador, um, in order to kind of bring that to bear against Sauron in the East. So you have this, like, the villain in the West and and the villain in the East and the good guys sandwiched between them, right? I, I, I really like how the game develops that uh, and shows that. But um, anyway, I, I, I think that uh, at, the, at the end of the day, he's still kind of deluding himself, right? And Gandalf emphasizes that fairly sharply, I think. Um, but um, anyhow, yeah, so... Uh, Hey, Griffith, let's get to work here. See, uh, uh, I was getting complaints last week that I did no lore questions, right? Uh, And this week here, like this week, I'm doing all lore discussion and no gaming action of any kind. Here's Griffith still standing 10 feet away from where he was standing when I started the stream. Uh, So there you go. But last week, there was upholstery, okay? I'm sorry. There was upholstery to talk about, and so I, I have to ask for your indulgence uh, and not getting to other lore questions, because why do you need separate, independent lore questions when you have the lore implications of upholstery uh, to deal with organically within the episode? So that was enough, but now we got to get back to work uh, for more flock here. In fact, we've only just begun to work for more flock, so Griffith needs to get busy here, or else more flock is going to be upset, which he is supposed to believe is a bad thing, and like he doesn't want a piece of more flock because he totally does. But anyway, um, we're supposed to find and challenge Glurthrak, Hoital, or Farmak. Okay, so we're gonna we're gonna challenge folks. Grifflet is all about that. So let's uh, let's see if we can... We'll just follow our quest arrows to the nearest one here. We have that big gulf we were looking at when we were exploring the map here. Yeah, there it is. Okay, so we're going to... Oh, there's a bridge? Yeah, let's go and see if we can Rivendell that bridge. Or not Rivendell that bridge, that is. Um, okay. Um, yeah, I know there was so much good stuff in that. In that, I mean, like that the exploration of the interior of Isengard. I mean, come on, that is an opportunity Griffith has been waiting for for months, years. Okay, um, okay. Ah, uh, oh, good question, Marielle. Marielle's full of good questions and good observations today. Who is this? Gluthrock. All right, Gluthrock. Uh, you are one of Morflock's new pets, are you? Well, sure. Uh, all right, let's do this, Morflock. Now I die. In your dreams. Okay, so let me see if I can answer a lore question while simultaneously keeping an eye on my morale to make sure that I don't. But I, oh yeah, I'm fine. Oh, did you disarm me? That is really annoying. I was just about to... Okay. Yeah, no worries. All right. Oh, man, this guy is a wuss. Take that, Ruth Rock. Um, okay, so... Oh, I gotta summon the lackey. Hang on. Lackey summoning. Needs to gonna rattle my shackles here. There you go. Rattle those shackles, Grifflet. Okay, ah, there it is. The guy who won't stand, who won't let me look at him. Nothing like a good fight to make you feel alive. Sure. Right. Um, you have some more names. 
Oh, I gotta find other. I gotta right fight other guys. Okay, so Mariel's question. Mariel's question was, um, what was it again? Oh, staffs. Yeah, really interesting question. Okay, what is the significance of a wizard staff? Saruman doesn't seem to have confiscated Gandalf's when holding him prisoner, but Gandalf breaking Saruman's staff is presented as a big deal. Great, great. Okay, cool. Staffs. That's a really interesting question. So, um, one thing, the uh, first interesting point. Um, Gandalf's staff, especially in the ho- in the in the Hobbit, is often called a wand. Right now, I don't think that when Tolkien uses the word wand, especially in the Hobbit. Um, I do not believe that the physical artifact that he is describing with the word wand um, is like what we would call a wand, like a conjurer's wand, like a little, you know, small black thing with a white tip on it, right? You know, so even when uh, when when Tolkien is describing Gandalf's wand, I, I don't think that that's the thing that we're supposed to be picturing. It does seem to be that wand is kind of a synonym for staff. Um, uh, it does suggest the staff as an instrument, like the, the use of the word wand does seem to suggest the staff as an instrument of his magic, like a thing that he uses in the course of, of, uh, uh, of, of, of doing his magic. But again, it doesn't mean that it's a little tiny thing, but it does mean um, that it's connected in some way. He's not. It's, it is not merely a prop for age, right? Um, there is, uh, and and we can see this, of course, surviving in the passage that I just quoted from, namely when Gandalf is trying to take his staff into Medusilt, right? And there's the whole debate about whether or not he should be allowed to do that. Morflag um, should have come himself. And so, done his own uh, dirty work. so yeah. I mean, the implication there, even the Rohirrim, are highly, uh, you know, uh, like, you know, Hama believes, you know, he states clearly that a staff in the hand of a wizard might be more than a prop for age, right? Uh, he knows that there is a greater significance to the staff, um, that it actually performs some kind of function, um, uh, magically speaking. What exactly that is, we don't really know. Um, we don't really know. Uh, so... More flock will be pleased. And when Morflock is pleased, it is good for all of us. Okay, okay. You've seen the slop right, they feed on. us. The good stuff is saved for the gate guards. The good stuff is saved for the gate guards. Ah, yeah. So they get better provisions, do they? They don't get served on slop? I suspected that that was the case. Okay, so go to the guardhouse. Yes! Sweet! Okay, he want, Morflock wants some of the good stuff. Okay, go to the water and grab some food, but don't let the gatekeeper see us with it. see see me with it. Okay, excellent. Oh yeah, let's raid the larder. Let us absolutely do this. That is fantastic. Okay, um, so, I. Uh, anyway, okay, so, um, one of the reasons, by the way, that I'm pointing to wand and, and staff as sort of near synonyms, uh, that's what Gandalf's name means. Uh, Gandalf, um is from Old Norse. It's one of the names of the dwarves in the Veluspa. That's why originally the character that became Thorin Oakenshield was originally named Gandalf in the first draft of The Hobbit, um, because he's a dwarf. Um, But it literally translates to wand elf. Gand alf uh, means wand elf, um, or staff elf. It's it's like, that's, you know, like an elf who goes around with a staff. Um, uh, So that's, that's literally what the name means. Um, anyway, so, okay, but, Mariel, I haven't gotten too much closer to answering your question, right? Um, what is the significance of the staff? Um, it is involved, well, we got a little bit closer, right? It does seem to be involved, the concept of it seems to be that it's involved, it is instrumental in some way to his casting of spells. Uh, remember, even, back to the Rohirrim thing, right, even um, Wormtongue suggests that it was correct, right? That Hama was right to suspect it. Uh, that, uh, you know, I, I, you know, I, did I not count you, counsel you to forbid his staff? Um, uh, he believes that the allowing of Gandalf's staff into Metaseld is an act of betrayal on Hama's part, right? So they 
clearly believe or suspect that the staff is instrumental in his ability to do magic, right? The magic that he does. Um, and I, I, again, I think there's evidence to suggest that they're correct about that. Um, uh, oh, so Mariel, uh, okay, quick side on Mariel's question about why is a dwarf called the staff elf in the Norse, in Old Norse in the first place? That's because dwarves are like a subset of elves in Norse tradition. Um, like there are several different kinds of it. The word elf just means something kind of different. Uh, and so the, uh, dwarves are elves, different kind of elf. Um, it's complicated, <laughs> but Tolkien redefines what it means to be an elf. It's one of the things that he does and redefines what it means to be a dwarf. Um, but, um, yeah, yeah. Um, okay, good. Anyway, so, uh, okay, let me try to regain, regain my train of thought. So wands, staves, Gandalf, Saruman. So, um, the other interesting piece of evidence about the significance of the staff or the power of the staff is in the bridge of Khazad Doom. You remember that Gandalf breaks his own staff. His own staff breaks in his hand when he smashes the bridge of Khazad Doom. Now, in the published text, that detail remains. His staff is broken on the stone, you'll remember in Frodo's poem. Um, but it becomes, as you can see through Frodo's poem, a sort of a symbolic moment, right? Um, uh, Gandalf smashing his staff on the stone and the staff breaking in his hand becomes a kind of symbol of his own self-sacrifice, right? His own giving up his life in order to stop the Balrog and cast the Balrog into the abyss. In the original draft, so if you go back, we just did the Treason of Isengard in Mythgard Academy. If you go back and read the, uh, the Treason of Isengard, watch the Mythgard Academy class uh, on the Treason of Isengard. In the original drafts, it seems to be a much more mechanical element than that. That is to say, there's a sense in which Gandalf's staff contains stored power. And so when he breaks it, he is breaking it in order to unleash the power that is stored in his staff, and that's how he blows the bridge. So the bridge is actually the, the, the staff rather, is the ammunition that he uses to blow up the bridge and take out the Balrog. Um, and that's much more explicit in the original drafts. And I think you get this sense, I, I mean, I get the, the, the clear sense that Tolkien has begun to move away from that much more kind of simplistic and sort of literal and mechanical sense of magic and how it works. Um, by the time we get to the published text, I don't think he's thinking in exactly those same kinds of ways anymore. But he was the first time through. So again, when we ask the question, why do wizards have staves and what do their staves mean? We can see we have several reasons to believe that they were instrumentally involved in the actual power so that if you take away the staff of a wizard or more importantly, if you break the staff of a wizard, right, then you are removing his power. You're crippling him. Right. Um, and that seems to be the significance. Now, again, when Gandalf breaks the staff of Saruman, right? Um, when Gandalf breaks the staff of Saruman, it is still primarily a symbolic moment. Notice nothing blows up, right? There's no explosion when Saruman's staff uh, 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 is broken. It's, it's, it's a symbolic assertion of Gandalf's authority, right? The staff becomes the symbol of his power, um, both his sort of political authority, right, as head of the council, and also his sort of status as wizard. The, the, the staff becomes a symbol of that. So when Gandalf commands, it just states that it is broken, right? Um, and then the staff breaks in response to Gandalf's proclamation of this, right? It is clearly a symbol of, you know, his, his power, Saruman's power is now broken. Remember the, he's like a snake whose teeth have almost all been pulled, all except his voice, right? That tooth pulling happens when his staff is broken. Again, at least symbolically. Uh, that's what happens there. Um, so why did Saruman allow Gandalf to keep his staff when he was a prisoner? Why does Gandalf leave with his staff? My answer to that is um, twofold. One, 
Saruman was not trying to destroy Gandalf. Saruman was trying to recruit Gandalf. That's very explicit, of course, in the conversation between them. And even when he imprisons Gandalf, he's imprisoning Gandalf, not punitively. He's not trying to punish him, right? He's not trying to destroy him. He's not going to go up and push Gandalf off the pinnacle of Orthanc. He is trying to convince him to come over, right? He is... Uh, putting Gandalf on ice until he, Gandalf, makes a better choice than he made when he refused the recruitment speech, right? So he wants Gandalf's power intact. He just wants Gandalf fighting on his side, right? He wants Gandalf to join him. So that's why he doesn't break his... I think that's why he doesn't break his power. Also, he's cocky. Saruman is cocky, right? He has a very high opinion of himself. So he... Um, is gonna, uh, so he, he's, it's like, it's a sign of how not afraid of Gandalf he is, right? Whatever, like, you can keep your staff, you still can't escape me, right? You still can't overpower me, you are powerless here in my center of, you know, in this tower, which is the center of my own power, whether you've got your staff or not, right? Whatever, I'm not afraid of you. That seems to be another, to me, that seems to be another part of the message to, uh, to Gandalf here. Uh, so, um, that's um, that's how I read his allowing Gandalf to keep his staff and the significance, therefore, of his staff being broken at the end. And as a freebie, corollary to that uh, uh, to that question, this is also why that uh, when people ask me, what is your least favorite thing about the Lord of the Rings films by Peter Jackson? Um my answer is not the ones. I, it's not Faramir. It is not Treebeard. Those are high on the list, but that those are not my the the one scene that Peter Jackson filmed that I object to more than any other moment in the entire film series is when the Witch King lands on the parapet and shatters Gandalf's staff. Gandalf stands up to him. The Witch King comes in, and the Witch King screams, and Gandalf's staff explodes. Uh, and I, I actually, the first time I saw that, of course, it's not in the, in the cinematic cut. It's only uh, that scene was added back in the extended edition. Um, I, I, it, I, I literally used to like scream like, no, when Gandalf stuff was so ticked me off that he would do that. Um, and actually, that scene is a classic example of um, uh, that. That scene is to me a classic example of the lack of thought that Peter Jackson and his team so often put into the adaptation of Tolkien. Like there's uh, the places where in the, again, it's not like it's all the way through and the Lord of the Rings films are awesome movies, but there are bunches of places where they just seem to not get it. They just flat don't get Tolkien's world and what's going on. Um, I'm not saying they don't know the stories and I know Philippa Boyens does. I know she knows the stories, but she doesn't get them very well in places. And that's one place where I would say like, look, only a completely tone deaf person would put in a scene like that and not realize that it meant 10 times more than they were making it. You don't have Gandalf's staff shattered by the witch King and then treat it like nothing happened. Right. Um, and that's just, that's just ignorant. Right. Um, whereas to give them credit in the Hobbit films, they almost never did that. Right. Hobbit films, terrible movies, but there are almost no places where they did stuff like that, where they just did like totally ignorant stuff. They did stuff that lots of people don't like. They did lots of things that are like cringe inducing and were horrible as films, but they got the books. They, they did a great job thinking through the books. I think the way that they engage with the Hobbit books, uh, with the Hobbit book and the other stuff around it. Uh, like from Unfinished Tales and stuff, is completely fascinating. And I really like the stuff that they did there. Huge improvement in their relationship with Tolkien's work. Just terrible films, by contrast. Now, I was pausing here in game. Griffith was standing patiently waiting for me to finish that explanation because, of course, I have a new area to look around in. The gatehouse, from which the food and pipeweed of Merry and Pippin come. So, uh, and I couldn't get in here before. Uh, so now I have to, uh, Griffith has more to investigate here. So, okay, we've got the, uh, looking up. This is huge for one thing. You know, the cathedral ceilings of rooms like this are always astounding to me. 
this is incredibly grand. Look at the columns, right? I mean, this is like a king's hall, even to the carpet, right? Look how the look how the carpeting, which is which is you know, made by the same carpet makers of the carpet from Isengard, um, how this flows and leads up to a bench, right? It totally looks like there should be a throne, and you've got the the banner, the orc version of the banner, right? Not the neat geometric version of the banner. Uh, but um, uh, the, you come instead to this, these, like, communal tables. Hey there, Mr. Gatekeeper. Sorry, I'm going to put my floaty names up for a minute here. Okay. So I'm supposed to pick up some good food and then sneak out so the gatekeepers don't... I want to... Okay, so now you don't have pipe weed. Whoa, okay, so you're a half-orc. That's interesting. Would you get out of my way? Morflux Lackey is so objectionable. Um, you are a half-orc. Huh. Why are you a half-orc? That doesn't make it... Are you all half-orcs? Or is it just you? And what animal is that? This looks like the flesh of I dare not guess what creature. It's not a pig. What is that? I don't even know. I have no idea. Um, Hmm. Hey, whoa, Griffith changed his clothes. There we go. Okay. Accidentally changed Griffith's clothes there. Okay. Um let me look at the other gatekeepers. Are you a half orc? Excuse me, are you a half orc? You are! You're like almost the same half orc. Are they all half orcs, Morphlox Lackey? Oh, we've got another strangely proportioned beast roasting over here. Look at the huge fire. These are such sumptuous surroundings. Wow. Um, this is quite an array of casks here. Is this all wine? Is it, oh, I thought there's more storage up high, but no, it's just decoration. Okay. So let's think here. It's very clear when you look at the stonework here, right? The old black stonework, but even more, that gold, that sort of tarnished gilt edging that we've got around here, right? This is obviously part of the original Numenorean construction. Look at that floor, right? Oh, man. That is obviously a Gondorian floor in the same style as the Gondorian doorways and things that we see elsewhere. This is part of the... So what was the function of this? Is this just... This is how they treated the gate guards and... Is this where the garrison lived? Because... We were looking at it last time, right? Many of these buildings around the edges are original... Right, part of the original Numenorean structure, so that we were imagining last time that we had a whole little mini city here, right? Like so, Isengard was like a Numenorean company town, um, with the garrison of this outpost, you know, this important outpost, watching the 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 gap of Rohan, um, or the gap of Kalinarthen, as I suppose it would have been called at that point. Um, but it, you know, those are you know. It, how plenty of housing and stuff, and we see that Saruman has expanded that, rather. Um, but this, this can't have just been, like, the barracks. I mean, I know they do things grandiosely in Gondor, but still, this can't have just been the barracks. There's no way. And look at all this stuff that... Oh, here's the food, yeah. The food that's going to come floating out later on. Okay, you know what's ironic about this? Um, 
Do you see the irony of what's in all of these caskets? What, what, are, what are we seeing, right? Vegetables everywhere. Vegetables, radishes, beans, carrots, right? That's funny. That's funny. Remember that's funny? When Merry and Pippin tell um, Aragorn and Gimli and Legolas what's for dinner, right? When they, when they show them the stores that they have, um, the one thing they say they don't have is green stuff, right? Uh, and I, I think it's, is it Pippin or Mary? I can't remember which one of them makes the joke about how the deliveries have been rather in- interrupted of late, right? So they don't have any fresh produce uh, to offer to them. And then we get into the gatehouse here, and this, this, the shelves are just packed with produce, right? There's produce everywhere in here. That's funny. That's funny. Must have just gotten a delivery, you know, one of the last de- deliveries they will ever get from their evil produce delivery people. Okay, so I have a theory. My theory is the reason that this gatehouse here inside the wall is so grandiose is that the tower itself was occupied by like the the governor, right? There was a there was a person who was appointed here as, you know, sort of the governor and steward of the tower. He lived in Orthanc itself, right? And he was the one who was sort of the political center, but that there would have been the uh, the sort of captains of the, the, you know, it wouldn't necessarily have been uh, like personally leading the whole garrison, right? So there would have been like two different structures, one sort of the political structure connected back to Gondor, and then second there would have been like the, the sort of the, the people who are actually running the camp, right? The people who are actually running the garrison uh, of the army here, and that this place right inside the gates would have been their sort of headquarters, which is why this looks kind of throne room-ish, right? Because it would have been the, the center, because again, this is not a barracks. Nobody, not even the Gondorians live in a barracks like this, right? Um, ooh, though that's an appealing idea. Um, Mariel is suggesting maybe it's a ceremonial place of welcoming and feeding newly arrived guests, but they would still see, but they would still have to be the guests of like the military captain, because any guests of the governor would be welcomed into Orthanc itself, right? There's no real reason to shunt guests out to here, because uh, there, now there'd, there'd be guest chambers still even in Orthanc. It's plenty big enough for that kind of thing. I like that idea, but no, so I'm thinking this is like the reception area of the, like, the military leadership. And that's why it's in the walls and by the gate, right, to sort of show that the, you know, the captain of the, uh, of the, of the guard is in, you know, in vigilance here by the gate. Wow, there is a lot of food here. But of course there would be. But my question is, why are there half-orcs? And of course you remember why I'm perplexed about the half-orcs, right? Because Mary and Pippin say explicitly that, so, that they're men. Um, that Saruman kept men to guard his gates uh, because he kept he, he he you know he he kept enough wisdom not to trust his orcs. Yeah, interesting. Okay, all right. Uh, ooh, did I finally ditch Morflock's lackey? I did. Oh, how wonderful. Okay, but now it's time for sneaking, Griffith. Pick up the basket, Griffith. Come on, you can do this. Okay basket of food. I've got a basket of food. Here it is. Oh boy, I'm in a hurry again. I get a speed boost with my basket of food. So, the point is not to sneak, but to outrun the... Oh, Morflex like he was just caught up in the corner. Oh well, he's still lurking about. Okay, make a dash for it. Sprint, Griffwood, sprint! Woo. Okay, where do I take it? Oh, all the way to Morflock. Okay. Man. Griffith is booking it. Holy cow. Yeah. Woo. See, but, uh, 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 Jenny, I'm not sure of that. Johnny is suggesting that maybe this was just Mary and Pippin's perspective that they they sort of 
you know, we're treating the, we're, we're sort of looking at the half elves or the half orcs rather as if they were, uh, as if they were men instead of orcs. But I don't think so because they're pretty clear on who are the half orcs, right? The half orcs and goblin men. I know that's not their phrase, but, um, uh, where's Morflock? Hello, Morflock. That's not you. No. Oh, great. Excuse me. I've got a basket for Morflock and I can't remember where he is. This way. Okay. So, Orc, if it's all the same to you, I'm just going to ignore you. Besides, you can't keep up with me. You got nothing. Morflock, where'd you go? Over here. Oh, there you are! Finally! Okay. Whew! This is much better than the slop we usually yeah, get. Yeah, it sure is, isn't it? I like you. You like me? Oh, the feeling is not actually mutual, Morflock, but that's okay. Oh, I gotta talk to your to the lackey again. Okay. Morflock is good to his friends. Just don't cross Just him. Just don't oh. cross him, and you'll be yeah. fine. No, wouldn't dream of it. Yeah. Wouldn't dream of it. You okay. know when to do as you're told. Okay. I at least know when to appear to look like I'm doing what I'm told. Okay, Ordon has built many of the siege engines the old man plans to use for the war. Okay. All right, siege engines. Let's go to the siege engines. Cool. Um... Let's see. Okay. So where are we going? Way over there. Okay. Oh, man. I slowed down again. Oh, well. No problem. Okay. What's this guy doing? Oh, he's eating. It's just more flux, lackey. Darn you. Look, if I wanted to look at your butt, never mind. Okay. I was trying to figure out that like mask helmet thing that that dude was wearing because it was interesting. But then Morflax Lucky feels that he has to impose his glutes between me and what I'm trying to look at, so fine. Um, all right. Well, there you are, up there. This is an innovative model. Okay, so we've got a little ram down here. That's cute. I think if you... Are you punching? and stabbing. You are punching and stabbing the siege engine. Okay. Look, I'm not a construction expert, but I think you're doing it wrong. I really do. Uh, maybe it's to test the toughness of the siege engine. Okay. I'll leave you to your important work. So, anyway... How is this meant to work? So we've got the ram, right? Can I get up there at all? No, I can't. Can I? We've got the ram, and it's swinging on chains, okay, f that are attached to that top frame. Okay. Okay, so this is just a ram. No one's meant to be up on top. We just, we swing it. How do we swing it? We push it. We, or what mechanism do we make the ram swing from those chains? We push it from the front and it swings back? That would seem puzzling. Hmm. I love how it has these uh, spikes down here so that, because even, even regular men as, as Morflux Lackey is so, Lackey is so uh, sh thoughtfully showing us, uh, 
you know, even a normal sized person is going to clear this thing. So these spikes are there to take you in the head, right? If you're trying to stand in the way of the ram, that makes sense. Ooh. This is, this is kind of like the battle buggies, except this is not a buggy. This is a full battle wagon. Oh, man. What, do you just fill it up to the brim with orcs? Is that what you do? Or does it get something else? Well, I think that's what you do. Wow. It's kind of, it's kind of amazing. Um, okay. Is this guy eating too? He is. I guess it's, I guess it's lunch break. You're one of Morflock's underlings? Uh, I'd rather he left me alone. Really? You got, you got real work to do, huh? Okay, most of these engines are nearly finished. You could use another crate of tools. Okay, follow the ring wall to the north. Crates near the anvil field by the great bellows. Okay, that is an interesting set of directions. We're done. Let us go. Okay, right, sl trolls. Yeah, trolls could... No, it's not that I, I'm not thinking that anything... I, I'm, or rather, it's not that I'm thinking that nothing could um, swing that ram. It's just there was no... <laughs> no handles. Right? It can, oh, I'm going the wrong way here. Let's not go the wrong way. Um, yeah, there's no handles for them to swing it. That might seem like a... But, but like, even trolls would have to grip something. What, do they just hold the side of the cylinder of the thing? How are they going to get any purchase on it? That's all. That's all I'm thinking. Um, okay. What are these tarp-covered piles? Are they tents? Are these people's tents? Like, this is a little lean-to over here. Does somebody live inside that big pile of... Maybe. Maybe. Perhaps, Crafty Cat, they are detachable handles. That makes a lot of sense. Do you think the trolls have to... They carry the detachable handles? Like, do they have pockets into which they put the detachable handles? Is this a... Is that a design? Do you think? Or is it a... No, I think it's just the way the weather is falling. I'm like, are those mountains on the side of that those bellows? Nah, it's just where the leather bunches up. Oh. Fine. You I have time to dispose of. Um, exactly, Jenna. You would think that Saruman would think of the handles, right? He'd be into that. Oh, come on, did you disarm me right before I could kill you? You're just dragging this out, man. Okay, this must be, right, this is the anvil field. Right, so pack, so crates of tools, those are, oh, no, those are swords. Crates of tools, somewhere around here, we're looking to the north. Oh, there they are, there they are. Crates of tools, oh, two more orcs on lunch break there, that's good. Okay, carry and crate really fast. Okay. Oh, running into the wall here. Okay, here we go. Let's zoom back down this path. Look at this. Look, I gotta pass this warg like he's standing still. Just feel the wind of my speed. Oh, wow, this is great. I wish you went this fast when you were delivering pies. Okay, here you go. Creative tools coming up. Boom, in a heartbeat. Wow, look at that. That's at the momentum of his speed. He flew overhead. That was fantastic. See, you try to keep up with me, Morflex Lucky. Wardon gave you such trivial work. Doesn't he know you belong to Morflock now? Okay, so I have to return to Morflock and tell him how he was slighted by the triviality of the labor that was given to me by... Okay. All right, I think I'm with you. Um, if I can find more flock again. Okay. 
All right, and let's see if I can find him all by myself this time without having to follow his quest ring to where he is. Let's see. Okay, so he is past this junction. Around Oh, now he shows up on the mini-map, so okay, that's easy enough. Boy, he is hiding. For somebody who considers himself, like, you know, the biggest thug in the prison yard here, he's standing in the bushes very inconspicuously. I do not think you need a shadow any longer. Yay! Oh, we can get rid of the lackey! Fantastic. And I get the bandana. Nice. Tell Fosh he's to keep you busy until I send for you. Fosh. Back in the depths. Yeah. Okay. Um... Go to the way north of the tower. Okay. Um, right, I remember where Fosh is. Fine. Hey, I thought the wacky was going away. Okay, right. All right. Um, good. Excellent. Okay. Um, let me uh, let me look at. I had a couple lore questions from last time. I think I can do another one today. See, I'm all full of lore questions here today. Let's see. Fair Venning couldn't be here today, but she left me with a reminder of lore questions that I didn't get to answer from last time. Okay. Ooh, here's a here's a uh, a simple one from Tony uh, from last time or the time before that, um, which I never got around to. Um, are the Valar the power? The Valar are called the powers. Are they the powers for all of Ea or just for Arda? Great question. Okay, so first let's um let's make sure we're. Why is this guy still following me? Is he gonna follow me until I get to Fosh? I guess so. Yeah. Oh! I couldn't save fall. I did not save fall successfully, huh? Oh well. Come on, what's the point of being a burglar if I can't jump off a cliff like that? Well, I got down anyway. Sort of. Where am I? Okay, no, not very far in. Oh well. Dude, I totally safe fell. I guess that's, uh... But I got rid of the lackey. It was worth it. It was worth it. Okay, so lesson learned. I uh, I can't say fall indefinitely. Well, I didn't know that. Okay. How high exactly does the cliff have to be before you can't say fall down it? That's what I want to know. Where am I going? Around and around and around. Okay, is the answer. Um, let's see. What was I doing? I was talking about Ea, right? Okay, vocabulary. So um, let's make sure our vocabulary is clear. So we've got Arda and Ea. What's the difference between Arda and Ea? So Ea is the biggest thing. Ea is creation itself, right? Ea means be, right? So uh, when uh, Iluvatar in the beginning says, Ea, let these things be. Um, and so Ea is translated as the world that is. So Ea is the universe. Okay? It's everything. Arda is the world. Um, more generally, as Tolkien came to sort of specify these things later on, um, Arda is not just the world in the sense of being the globe. Um, it is also... Oh... Hi, you're going to help me move faster, aren't you? That's great. I accept. Um, Arda is not just the, the Earth. Arda is like the solar system, right? It's, uh, it's the, you know, the entire, this entire sort of complex, right? Um, okay, so here we go. Moving a little faster now. Um, uh, so, so yeah, so Art, so Ea is the whole universe. Arda is our world, the earth, the sun, 
you know, the other planet, again, our solar system, essentially. So, let's see, how close are we to Fosh? I just missed it. Excuse me, if you wouldn't mind coming with me, because I, I, I missed the turn, I'm just like, now that I learned I just can't say fall down all the way from the top, and I gotta wind my way laboriously down into Fosh's domain, here's the highway down, okay. Um, right, so, uh, so the question, therefore, so to specify, so they are the Valar called the powers, right? So Tony's question is, are they the powers only of Arda, only of the solar system? Are they restricted to this, or are they, in fact, the powers of the entire universe, right, evolve? Yeah, that's a great, it's a great question. My answer is both, is sort of, um... Anyway, let's hang on. Morflock says you can walk about unguarded. I can totally walk uh. about unguarded. Help in the kitchens. Yes, sir. Help in the kitchens. What time is it? Okay, not quite yet. Time to get my kids. Got to make sure. Don't want to abandon my child at school. Um, so, kitchens. That way. Got it. Um... First, are the powers the powers for all of Ea? Sort of. Right? The answer to that question is yes, in the sense that Manway does in fact seem to be a big deal, globally speaking. Right? Um, that is, uh, you know, Manway is the, you know, he's the, the, the you know, the vice gerent of uh, Iluvatar here in Arda. Um, but that's not to say that, you know, in the big picture, when you put all of the Ainur to, together, Manway is not that big a deal, right? He's only locally a big deal because he is the he is the greatest of all of the Ainur who descended into Arda. Uh, so, you know, in that in that small, he's he he's a big fish in that smaller pond, right? But in the bigger pond, he's not a big deal. That does not seem to be the case. He is a big deal, right? Um, he and Melkor were brothers in the thought of Iluvatar. They were the two greatest of the Ainur, of all of the Ainur, right? And many were told of those who chose to descend into Arda were of the greatest and most noble of all of the Ainur, right? So, in a sense, are they, like, they're really important, you know, considered overall, not just... Um, not just considered as, uh, uh, you know, sort of relative to, to Arda itself. But, of course, there's another really important way in which they really are just the powers of Arda. And that is, I, you know, I've referred already a couple times to them, dis their choice to descend into Arda, right? The Ainur were the servants of Iluvatar, they're sort of in the halls of Iluvatar, which are kind of metaphorical, right? Um, the halls of Iluvatar, this is, uh, you know, the, the outside, the, the, sort of place outside of space and time uh, where Iluvatar and the, you know, the spiritual Ainur dwell before the creation of the universe. Um, the, uh, some of the Ainur choose to bind themselves to Arda and they descend into Arda and there they are bound to Arda and their life becomes joined with the life of Arda. That's, that is the sense in which they are the powers of Arda. Their life is bound to it. It is bound to them. They, are, uh, uh, they provide the life and shape the life of Arda itself. Um, they've, they chose that. They were joined to that by Iluvatar. They don't have that same relationship with the entire universe. It's that, so in that sense, they are the powers of Arda specifically. But the Ainur who have bound themselves to become the Valar, to become the powers of Arda are also, you know, some of the greatest of all of the powers, period. Right? So, that's the sense, Tony, in which it's kind of both things in that way. Um, yeah, yeah. Um, interesting. So, Phil says, is it possible that Sauron thought that he might aspire to be considered among the Valar himself? Yes. Phil, in a sense that is true. Um, the Valar and the Maiar are not different species, right? They are all Ainur. They just are, they are Ainur who are on sort of different levels and 
some of them are serving others, right? The lesser are servants of the great, you know, they, they're like the people of the greater. Um, and they all work together. Sauron was one of the people of uh, Aule originally, the valor of the of the uh, of the earth and of Smithcraft, um, and he wants to set himself up as a power, right? He wants that's generally the story of the evil people, right? They want to aggrandize themselves. So absolutely, he wants to aggrandize himself. But it's not just I want to, you know, sit at the big kids' table, right? It's not it's not just that. It's also the kind of the the kind of relationship that he wants to establish with the what kind of dominion he wants to have over the world is the kind of dominion that the Valar have over the world. They've been granted it by Iluvatar, right? They have authority over the world and they can shape it and form it. Melkor has that authority too, in a sense, but he wants to have all the authority. He wants to be the only one who is determined. He wants this place to be, he, he names this realm unto himself. Right, and wants to be the sole ruler, and and uh, dom- and to have dominion over all of Arda. Sauron is, in a sense, trying to elevate himself to the, the, the dominion he is attempting to establish over Middle Earth. It does seem to be a way of him saying, "I want to have this kind of dominion, this kind of power, like the Valar." So he is, in in that sense, trying to supplant the Valar. Though the Valar are still themselves inconveniently present over there in Valinor, uh, and probably aren't going to have any of it in the end, um, but at least the kind of dominion he would establish over Middle Earth would be like the authority of the Valar over Arda. Back for more? Um, I'm surprised you're still alive. <laughs> no problem. Oh, more slop, huh? Okay, slop cleaning. We can do that. Yeah, I'm an experienced slop cleaner. Um, so, Tony asks, um, in that way, if Melkor is not the evil for the whole universe, does that mean that the rest of Ea is not fallen? Yes. Yes. Um, and no. So, remember that Ea comes to be when Iluvatar gives being to the song of the Ainur, right? Um, so, the, what are you up to? Oh, oh right, you're the guy, sorry, I, I forgot, yeah. Hey, hey dude, what's up? Hey, Okay. you no. there? Yeah. Oh, no, you. don't look at me. No problem, okay. Uh, you've gotten your hands on a pinch of poison, really? Can I add it to one of the meals for the Orakai? Okay. All right. Okay. So I'm gonna poison the Orakai. This is very subversive. Where's the? What is that? A lump of slop? I was expecting a pot. Oh no, this is just a a Uruk's meal. Okay, I have secretly added poison to the Urukai meal. Let's see if they notice. Um, okay, more slop cleaning. So anyway, okay, so Tony, sorry, I was explaining about so the so remember we get the music of the Einar, right? And then the music of the Einar finishes, and then Iluvatar gives he says, Behold your minstrelsy. Right? So he gives them the vision, which allows them to see for the first time. Right, He gives them sight where before it was only hearing. Uh, and says, I want you to see what your music has made. Right, And then the third step, after he shows them the vision of it, is to make it real. Right, is to grant it being, and he does so by pronouncing Ea, right, let these things be. So the universe... The entire thing is an expression of the music of the Ainur. And so since, Tony, the discord of Melkor is part of that, explicitly, as Iluvatar explains when he stops the music, right? The discord of Melkor is woven through all of the music and all of Ea is an expression of that. Therefore, no, according to the sort of the theology of the... Um, oh, sorry, right, bucket. Um, uh, according to the theology of the Ainur Lindelay, 
all of Ea, all of the universe, is fallen because that fallenness is derived from the discord of Melkor, which was part of the original music, right? It is still going to be a tributary of the glory of the whole, right? Uh, the will of Iluvatar for the good of the universe is not going to be thwarted by the discord of Melkor, but it does run through everything. So the rest, the non-Arda portions, are not, are not unfallen in Tolkien's world. But... They also don't have the connection to Morgoth specifically that Arda gets. When the rest of the Valar descend to Arda uh, and establish themselves here in our solar system, Melkor comes to, uh, out of envy, it would appear, and claims that for itself. And he connects himself to Arda in this essential way, his his binding to Arda becomes, in a sense, more profound than the binding of the rest of the Valar, um, in how he distributes his own power through Arda itself, um, and diminishes himself thereby um, through his claiming dominion over it. So he has claimed dominion. The evil influence of Melkor works in that sense more directly on Arda than anywhere else that we know of. Um, so that's why my first impulse was to say yes. The rest of Arda, the rest of AI, is not affected like Arda because it doesn't have that relationship with Melkor. But but then again, that discord is is woven through the whole thing. So you do everything slowly okay. and poorly. Oh well, sorry about that. Go fill up a pan and carry it. Oh, feed the prisoners. Okay. Let's get a bucket of slop, and then I think when I get to the prisons, I'm going to have to stop. Okay, off we go. I can fight while I'm carrying a bucket, right? I think I can. Yes, I can. Oh no, maybe I can't. Shoot. I can't. Oh well. I was going to try to kill that guy too, and then I would go double fast, wouldn't I? But, never mind. I can outrun him. Um, okay. Um. Cool. So I'm going all the way up to the prisons, right? Stay on this road. Alright. Dungeons are to the north. Thank you for the directions. Okay. Yeah, so Tony, that makes you think of the Eldil in the Space Trilogy. It is not a coincidence. Uh, the Eldili uh, in Lewis's Space Trilogy. God, what is going on? My camera. Ugh, okay. Uh, the the Eldili, uh, the Eldila in the Space Trilogy, uh, Lucius Lewis's Space Trilogy, and the... Um, Wait, this way? Okay. Um, and the, um, uh, the, the Valar, Tolkien's Valar, are very similar. Um, they are built, uh, both of them, on the same concept, and that concept is the medieval idea of the planetary intelligence. Um, and I've talked about this before at times. When people ask Tolkien, are the Valar angels? He would say no. But what he meant was yes. <laughs> that is to say, when Tolkien, um, when Tolkien said no in answer to the question, are the Valar angels, he didn't mean no, they are not angelic beings who serve God and exist in a spiritual way in service of God, helping to govern the world. They are that. Um, what he meant is they're not angels specifically because, of course, we in the modern world use the word angels in a kind of generic way that it was not used in the Middle Ages. Um, angels are the messengers that are sent by God to the world in order to, deli to deliver specific messages. Um, like, hi, Joshua, march around Jericho seven times and blow your horns and the wall will fall down. I was sent to tell you that, right? Or, hi, Mary, you're going to have a baby. Surprise, right? That's what angels do. That's their job. Um, 
archangels too. Archangels are one rank up above them, but they still, they're in the business of interacting with the world, even if you're like the archangel Michael, right? And the primary way in which you are engaged with the world is to like wage celestial war against this, uh, the servants of Satan. So uh, anyhow, that's, 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 what you do if you're an angel. Planetary intelligences are of the same kind, but they're much higher up in the in the pecking order. Um, and yes, so the El Delai uh, in in um, uh, C.S. Lewis's Space Trilogy are explicitly um, uh, Oyerasu are explicitly planetary intelligences. Uh, the Valar. Are le- they the Valar are less close to the medieval model. C.S. Lewis was sticking very clearly and very explicitly to the medieval model, when um, where the different planetary intelligences are attached to different planets, uh, and where the concept of those planetary intelligences are connected back uh, uh, to the the uh, Greco-Roman pagan traditions, right? Where uh, uh, Perelandra, the planetary intelligence in the sphere of Venus. Uh, looks and acts a lot like the goddess Venus, right? Or rather, to say it the other way around more properly, when the stories of the goddess Venus were developed by the Greeks and Romans, it was because there was some reality behind that, right? Uh, Paralangia really is in some ways like that, just as Mars or Malacandra really is like that. So Lewis was following much more overtly and much more explicitly following the medieval traditions on that, whereas Tolkien was not just sort of telling a story from within the perspective of that that kind of medieval worldview. Rather, he was deliberately building his own mythology. So it's not the same. It doesn't work exactly the same. But on the same level, totally, absolutely. They are both planetary intelligences of that kind and on that level. So yeah, it is... uh, it is right to think of them in that kind of way. That's that's a that's a that's a pretty good way to think about them. Okay, so I will resume and talk to my friend Baldgar here um, when I feed my the prisoners next time. Um, but not this coming week, because of course a week from right now, I'm going to be, I think, in the British Library looking at the one surviving manuscript of Beowulf. That's where I'm going to be a week from today because London Moot is next weekend and I can't wait to uh, uh, to meet. I know I'm going to be able to meet a bunch of you that I'm really excited about that. I look forward to seeing you uh, there. Um, so I will be in London next week. So I'll not be able to stream, um, but I will be back for the week after that. Uh, thank you guys so much for joining me today. I will see you guys in a fortnight and we'll be back in the month of May. Um, uh, Melindrian, yes, I'm looking forward to meeting you uh, in London next week. That's going to be great. Uh, so thank you very much. Druid's Fire will be covering for me next week. So thank you that, for that, Druid's Fire. And I will see you guys next week. Bye now. Thanks for joining in on my rambles around Standing Stone's brilliant digital adaptation of Tolkien's world. If you enjoy these adventures, please consider supporting this and other entertaining educational programming by donating at signumuniversity.org fund.